Let's stand as we read God's Word. Um, if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm going through the, uh, the Easter story through the book of John. So again, we're in the book of John, chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their, evil, their works are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. You may be seated. So uh, I want to start out with a question, and I'm actually looking for answers today. You know how sometimes I ask questions, they don't answer this. Um, but I'm actually looking for questions. Have you ever been in a room in your, or, uh, in a room in your house or anywhere else where it is absolutely, completely, utterly dark. <laughs> what? She said she was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was already nodding her head before I said dark. Um, if you have, how does that make you feel? How would it feel to be in a room there was absolutely no light? Alone? time to sleep we we had that we had a when my mom moved in with us we gave her our bedroom upstairs and we moved downstairs into travis's room and travis's room downstairs in the in the parsonage has no window so it's illegal bedroom but it had no window but you could close the door and you didn't even know what time it you know people that go into solitary confinement no wonder they go nuts you don't know whether it's night or day so it can be it can be scary uh I loved it because if you work night shift, you could, you could fool your brain into thinking it was nighttime. So, um, have you ever been in, in, a, in a place where it's really, really dark? I have, but I don't want to say when. But anyway, it's been really, really dark and you walk out into the light. Um, and that can be painful <laughs> because it takes, it takes that time for your, yourself your eyes to adjust to that, to that light. And it, it can be scary going from, from darkness to light. Uh, even though it's the right thing to do, sometimes it can be very scary. Um, I think before we begin the message this morning, uh, I think it would be important to take just a few minutes to try and understand who Jesus is talking to. Um, I think it would be more important to understand what Nicodemus would be going through at this point in his life because he is talking to Nicodemus. And in John 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. A man, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things or signs that you do unless God is with them. So even though this man was a Pharisee, and we know that the Pharisees were a, a unique sect of the, the uh, Jewish faith, that they, they enforced the law. They enforced the law. That was their job, to protect the law. Uh, so he was a part of this, and he, even though this would be considered going into the enemy camp, he goes. He had a deep understanding that there was absolutely no way that Jesus could be who his friends, the other Pharisees, said he was. Because they were saying he was from Satan, that he was this, he was that. But Nicodemus understood there's absolutely no way that this man can be like this because of the things that he's doing. He has to be from God. He's still scared of the rejection because you need to understand. I remember when I first started studying for ministry, one of the, 
one of the one of the books I was reading, it said, being a Jew is not a religion. It's a way of life. It is, it is a family. It is a community. It is all-encompassing. And at that point and at that time, for, and he had this high standing within the Jewish community, for him to be seen going to Jesus could mean that he would lose that standing and he would actually be thrown out of the community. So he had a lot at risk here. So, hence, maybe going at night. Less of a chance uh, of of being caught. Go in the dark. Uh, So he's scared of that. And maybe he isn't sure what he completely believes about Jesus. Maybe he's just a little bit confused. I, I don't understand. I'm watching this man, Jesus, heal people and help people, and bless people, and love people, and my friends, that that community, that life that I have lived, my whole life that I have lived, they're all telling me that this guy's straight from hell. And I just, I can't connect the dots. He's confused. And, And he's about to get more confused. Because it says, what I just read in verse 1 and 2, now there was a a Pharisee named Nicodemus, and he came and he said, Rabbi, we know that you're from God because nobody can do this. And then in verse 3 it says, Jesus answered him. And I find that interesting because he didn't ask Jesus a question. He made a statement. Can clearly see that you are from God. Because nobody can do what you're doing if he's not from God. And it says, Jesus answered him. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We sang that song freely. That song freely was Cora Tavernier's favorite song. And I cannot sing it without thinking about Cora Tavernier. Just, you know, she would just love to sing that song. But there's a line in there. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And so Jesus says this to him. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Do you think for a second that Nicodemus understood what he was talking about? If you had never walked in a church, or maybe you're in a church and it's kind of new, and you hear that term born again, and it's just like, what does that mean? I mean, he was confused before, but now he's even more confused. So do you think for a second that, that he understood that he had been taught his whole life, his whole life, like if you look at a Pharisee, um, at a very young age, he would have shown some kind of gifting for the scriptures, for, for reading, for understanding. And he would have been taken aside and he would have been instructed. You hear Paul say, say I, was, I was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was one of those teachers that would take these select boys, and it was, sorry, ladies, it is what it is, or it was what it was. Um, they would take these select boys, and they would teach them. They would take them deeper into the scriptures, and deeper into this understanding. And so his whole life, he had been taught what? It's about the rules. That's what he had been taught. You follow the rules. When life's going good, you follow the rules. When life's going bad, you follow the rules. When you're happy, you follow the rules. When you're sad, you follow the rules. When you're rich, you follow the rules. When you're poor, you follow the rules. You follow the rules. Follow the rules. Follow the rules. And then, as a Pharisee, get everybody else to follow the rules. When in doubt, see rule one. Follow the rules. When the rules are unfair, follow the rules. When the rules suppress, follow the rules. That was his life. Not only that, people come up and say, what's the rules? And he could tell them the rules they had to follow. And how they had to follow. Because they took the Ten Commandments and they wrapped this whole mess of rules around them. And it got to be ridiculous. You couldn't work on a Sabbath, so you could only make so many steps. So the Jewish people would get up in the morning and they would walk that many steps minus one away from home. So they knew if they walked home that day, they wouldn't be breaking the rules. That was his life. And so... Nicodemus said to him, of course, Nicodemus has questions. So Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I mean, that's a realistic question. We 
we see that this, only man, this man can only think in the physical possibilities. And he's saying this is physically impossible to be born a second time. And if you had never walked in a church, you'd never heard that term, and there'd been never mentioned before, and I said to you, well, you have to be born a second time. They would say, that guy's nuts. What is he talking about? And here comes his answer. Jesus answered, truly, tr this time he asked a question. How can it be? This time he answered, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is when everyone who is born of the spirit. So Jesus is basically saying to this man that there are things that happen around you that are different in a different realm that you will never understand. That's just the reality of it, and I know you don't understand, and you will never understand it. You can't understand the things that happen around you every day. So how will you understand this? You can't understand the wind. There's an east wind. Okay. That means it's coming that way, but usually it's coming this way. And what means does it go that way? And why does it go that way? And where does it come? Where does it start? It has to start somewhere. You can't understand that. And so he's saying to them, or to him, you don't have to understand it. You only have to believe it. I don't expect you to wrap your head around this, Nicodemus. Just believe me when I'm telling you this. Because he, what, what did he start off? I know you're from God. Right? That's what he started off. I'm from God. Believe me. Right? John chapter 14. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then in verse 9 it says, Nicodemus said to him, how can this be? Right? So, so Jesus goes a bit further, but Think about this sentence alone, and we can understand that Nicodemus is saying, I don't get it. I just don't get it. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay to not get it. He goes on, and, and he, we, we jump ahead now to verse 14 and 15 where we started. And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So, so we know the story. She put it up as I say it. Oh, wow. I better read it right, eh? We know the story, right? The slaves are, they're slaves in Egypt. They're captured in Egypt. And we talked about this, I think, last week. <coughs> they were captives in Egypt, and they cried out to God. They cried out to him. And God sent Moses. And Moses is not the character that you would pick. Moses is not the character Moses would pick. My favorite line about Moses is, here I am, send him. He wanted Aaron to do it. But God sends him. And, and through Moses, God delivers the plagues, right? The, the plagues of blood and fleas and gnats and flies and frogs and everything. And then we talked about this. I know we talked about this because we're preparing for the Passover. We talked about the plague of the Passover, the plague of the firstborn. Where every firstborn in Egypt died that night. And so the people leave. The people leave, and the people passively plunder the Egyptians. It's a passive plunder. Because the Egyptians are giving them gold and everything. Say, here, take this and get out of here. Go worship your God. And, and, and they leave. Uh, and, and, and God parts a sea for them to walk across on dry land. So that's the first part of the story. The second part of the story is not so good. Because they start to complain. Complain about the weather, complain about the lack of water, complain about the food. Would it be better for us to have died in Egypt than to die out here? They complain about that and they complain about the man that God picked to lead them. It becomes all about complaint. So God sends snakes. He sends snakes to bite them. 
and a whole bunch of them will die. So now it becomes about survival. And so God, uh, <laughs> they repent. They repent and they cry out to God and God hears them again. And God says to Moses, make a bronze snake, put it on a pole. And if you look at the symbol for a healthcare worker today, it is, it is a pole with snakes on it. That's where the symbol comes from. And the idea is if you look at the snake on the pole, the bronze snake, you will live. And if you don't, you will die. Not a big misunderstanding there. Look and you will live. They look up at the snake and they live, and if they don't look up, they die. So Jesus is saying that there is salvation for a look at the Savior. There is salvation for a look at the Savior. Just as Moses was raised, raised up the snake in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man. And, and he's not just talking about the cross. Look up. And, and not just a glance. You know, like, you know, oh yeah, there's Jesus. Look. I remember hearing uh, someone say to a new person who come to the church, and he said, give yourself the benefit of the doubt and come for six weeks. Take a real look at Jesus. Take a real look at God. And then the most famous verse, but I'm going to read two verses because we don't. We don't do that. We only read John 3.16, but we don't look at John 3.17 because John 3.17 to me is a slap in the face. And I'm going to tell you why. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. And you ask, how is this a slap in the face? I'm going to get to it. Nicodemus had been taught his whole life that it was about the rules. It's about the rules, it's about the rules, about the rules. His position in the community was, it's about the rules. His, his position in society was, it's about the rules. What do you mean you can say, be saved by a look? Could this mean that God's love is greater than, much greater than Nicodemus ever understood? And the answer is yes. And you know what? We, as a church, and I don't mean this church, and I don't mean you personally, I mean the church worldwide, we as a church are no better than the Pharisees. Because my vision of God through my whole life was some long-haired guy far off waiting for me to screw up so he could take his thumb and go, Ew! and it wasn't God that taught me that, it was the church that taught me that. And it wasn't the preacher because I never listened to a sermon in my life. It was the people in the pews. Whatever church I went to, that's the feeling I got of church. And I say that if the world could look at the church and see the love of God and only the love of God, we would have to build a balcony. What I remember about the church is the people not letting their, their children play with me because I was a bad kid. That's the vision I have of the church. And that's why I preach today, because I would need to change that vision. Because if we could show the love of God, we couldn't hold them back. And the love of God doesn't always have that answer. Sometimes the love of God just holds your hands and cries with you. Because that's what it is. Am I terrifying the twins? And I think Nicodemus is learning that maybe, maybe, just maybe, it's harder to be damned into hell than he thought. But he is certainly learning that it is easier to be saved than he thought. You don't have, I, I, I said something the other night in Bible study, and I, I, think, I think the biggest Hurdle, no, not the biggest, but one of the things that the church, the evangelical church did years ago was an invent this thing called the sinner's prayer. And get people to say it, and as well, see you. Figure it out for yourself. And I really believe, I have to believe, that you don't have to say that prayer. Your heart has to say that prayer. And you may not have a word but just a surrender that says, okay, 
When I came to God, I didn't, I didn't get down on my knees and say, Dear Heavenly Father and Jesus above, I repent of my sins. And I basically said, okay, you want me, you got me. Now help me. I want, I want, to, I want to read you a, a psalm, part of a psalm that David wrote talking about the situation of the, the snake in the desert. Psalm 107, verses 17 to 19. Let's see, you get that one up before I get it read. Some were fools through their sinful ways and became, because of their iniquities suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death and they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. That's the picture of God that I want to show. That's the image of God I want my church to show. And I say my church not because I own the church or I run the church or I'm, I, I'm part of it just like you are. And I don't see ministry as a vertical thing. I see it as a lateral thing. And I'm here for a while and I'll be there for a while. And one day I'm going to be sitting beside Brenda with my arm around her and listen to somebody else. You know. And I look forward to that day. Right now I'm here. Because that's where he's put me. But I want the church, my church, to say that. To people that walk through the door. To teens that show up at our youth group. That was so biblical for Josh to go get a glass of water. When you have given a cup of water to someone in my name, I am with you. I was there. You gave it to me. And I'm going to tell Josh that the next time I see him. I want to freak him out last night, but I'll get him alone sometime. He'll be walking by a bus and I'll go, Hey, Josh, come here. Because he crosses in front of my bus for the next month. Usually I blow the horn when they walk between my bus. My bus is, I'm driving a bus for the next month, and the bus where I park is right where everybody crosses to go in the parking lot. And the ones that I know, when they get in front of the bus, I beat the horn <laughs> and scare them. Imagine, am I scaring people? Okay, never mind. Um, this is an amazing, amazing image of God that we see in the psalm, and the psalmist describes the same event in the wilderness. Salvation through a cry. Life everlasting through a look. Because the reality of all the struggles of Israel and through all the struggles of our life and everything that we go through, God is there. And God is listening and God cares and God loves. This world is broken. But God's there. I'd like us to stand and I'm going to close in a prayer. And this, this is an old, old prayer. And it's 12 words. And it's very simple. But it says so much. I'm just going to read what, what someone else said about it. There's an ancient prayer that can distill in 12 words the simplicity of our salvation. It is called the Jesus Prayer. Pray it often. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, guide and direct us every day. We thank you that there is salvation through a look. Help us to look to you at all times, in every situation. May we, um, when the world looks at our church, may they see your love and your love only. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for coming. Have a great week. Um, those who are taking the membership class, hang around. I'll get things set up.